who is minding Alberta's fish and wildlife. And we are really honored to have such an outstanding, committed speaker. And don't laugh, Lorne, you are an outstanding citizen. Um, he's a professional biologist, retired from the Alberta Fish and Wildlife Service, maybe 10 years ago or so, uh, co-founder of the stewardship initiative Cows and Fish. Now this is huge because cows impact streams and rivers and the fish don't like that. So that's what he and his buddy corrected. <clears throat> Lorn is an elegant writer. He does not hesitate to remind Albertans of their conservation commitment. He is in the process, or he's actually finished writing the book. The book is entitled Streams of Consequence, Dispatches from the Conservation World. And now I look forward to reading that book because it's a bunch of essays which he has written over the years, and I assume that, and they are compiled. And I tell you, he is an elegant writer. Norm, will you please come up and tell us who is minding Alberta's fish and wildlife? <laughs> Thank you, Klaus. And uh, you. Gordon Campbell, if you're listening, glad to have you here. <laughs> this is close to April Fools, April 1st. And Mark Twain said about April Fool's Day, this is the day upon which we are reminded of what we are the other 364. <laughs> <laughs> so following that, you might have thought, or had been fooled into thinking that Alberta's fish and wildlife resources were publicly owned and as public assets were managed with that broad public interest intent. Alberta has followed the North American model of wildlife conservation where wildlife resources are conserved and held in trust for all citizens. This was a legacy from our European ancestors who immigrated here and didn't want wildlife owned by royalty or by the rich. The Natural Resources Transfer Act of 1939 conferred responsibility for fish and wildlife resources to the province. And provincial management had its roots in this transfer from the federal government and dedicated departments oversaw that responsibility. The Alberta Fish and Wildlife Division was the agency established in 1959 that had its roots in the old fisheries and game branches that began in the 1930s. The Fish and Wildlife Division was the Alberta government agency that inventoried and assessed fish and wildlife populations, allocated opportunity for hunting and fishing, determined species at risk and their recovery, ran fish hatcheries, provided hunter training and conservation education, enforced fishing and hunting rules, engaged in habitat restoration and improvement, and most importantly, provided advice on proposed land uses to ensure that populations of fish and wildlife were conserved. And most importantly, with the institution of the Fish and Wildlife Division, it changed from being game management to being wildlife management. Wildlife in the fullest extent of that definition. Now you might be fooled into thinking Alberta's fish and wildlife resources are still being managed with you in mind. As hard as you search today, you will not easily find the fragments of the old Fish and Wildlife Division it will not exist under any recognizable name or department. I admit some bias in this assessment since I was part of the Fish and Wildlife Division before the hemorrhaging began 
when it was still considered one of the elite fish and wildlife agencies in North America. Now, I'm going to ask you all to think about why should you care? Maybe I'll do a little survey, uh, a little bit of audience participation after you've indulged in a big meal. How many of you watch birds? Hands up and keep them up. How many of you have bird feeders? Keep them up, keep them up. How many of you uh, watch wildlife programs? Uh, how many of you hunt or fish? And how many of you engage in art that uses wildlife? Oh good, so I don't have to convince you of the value of wildlife. But I'll just go through some of the aspects of why wildlife is important. I think first of all, it's heritage value. Uh, fish and wildlife are remaining symbols of the wild. Uh, a heritage that each Albertan should carve a place for in our collective psyches. Bighorn sheep is our mammal. The uh, great horned owl is our bird, chosen by school children actually. And the bull trout is our provincial fish. So we have, to a degree, created some heritage value around wildlife. We have legal responsibilities. The province is signatory to both provincial and federal conventions on biodiversity protection and maintenance. And we also have obligations under Aboriginal treaties. Wildlife are indicators. They are sentinels. They are our report cards. As an example, the presence and abundance of native trout signals a high degree of watershed health. It's the gold seal of water quality. Declines in populations are a distant early warning signal about the intensity, frequency, type, and cumulative impact of land use activities. Fish and wildlife provide recreation. They provide economic advantages. They provide tourism. There are about 328,000 licensed anglers in Alberta, about 128,000 hunters. Hunting and fishing generated $264 million. That was in 2008. It hasn't been updated since. And I, I would remind you that bird identification guides outsell Bibles. <laughs> that provides you an indication of how popular wildlife is. And I would, I would also add that tourism is a $10 billion a year activity, some of which is related to watchable wildlife. And lastly, ecological. And that, I think, confers upon us a responsibility, maybe a moral obligation. For example, to protect bull trout, our native fish and provincial fish, and the essential habitat upon which they rely inevitably isn't about saving bull trout. It's about saving us. And in that endless, fragile chain of interdependence that is tenaciously intertangled, the life cycle of bull trout, trout is linked to us. And so there are moral responsibilities as well. All right, so what's happening? Well, the UCP government has been stealthily engaged in the final gutting of what was the Fish and Wildlife Division. Fish and Wildlife allocation has been hived off to forestry, parks, and tourism under the auspices of a minister who coincidentally is one of the largest guiding and outfitting companies in Alberta. Shame. I'm sure that isn't a conflict of interest. No. <laughs> he has called it the hunting and fishing branch. And so that takes us back. Remember, it was changed in 1959 to the Fish and Wildlife Division from the old fish and game branches. So now we're back to the game branch after a long period of time. The fish culture section that's all the fish hatcheries, have been sent to agriculture and irrigation. 
leaving the species at risk function still behind in environment and protected areas. Previous conservative governments transferred enforcement, that's the Fish and Wildlife Officers, to the Solicitor General's Department. In that department, and based on UCP promises to reduce rural crime, these Fish and Wildlife Officers are treated now more like county cops, diminishing their roles in fish and wildlife work, including problem wildlife. Habitat protection responsibilities related to energy development have been handled or, or have been devolved to the Alberta Energy Regulator and the Alberta Utilities Commission, who in turn ask the energy industry to regulate itself. Forest companies, especially those with forest management agreements, are expected to concern themselves with fish and wildlife <laughs> habitat protection and maintenance with no oversight mechanisms. In my experience, self-regulation runs second to self-interest. <laughs> Much of the Fish and Wildlife Inventory and Habitat Development function went to non-government uh, agencies like the Alberta Conservation Association, and resource education was privatized under the Alberta Hunter Education Instructors Association. You can see a trend here. The Alberta Professional Outfitters Society, that's the commercial guides and outfitters of which the Minister of Forestry is part, has recently been given the funding achieved through an annual auction of hunting privileges for two bighorn sheep, two elk, two moose, two mule deer, two antelope, and two turkeys. Maybe the turkeys was an unintentional mishap. Those funds were dispersed, used to be dispersed by the Alberta Fish and Game Association through a series of grants to applicants for research and management actions. It's unclear how the Alberta Professional Outfitters Society will handle these funds, what the guidelines for those funds might be, and how that will benefit fish and wildlife for the public. The Alberta Professional Outfitters Society has successfully lobbied for another change to allow those successful bidders on those ministerial hunts to hunt year-round for those species. This may be legal, but it's hardly ethical. Finally, the Alberta Professional Outfitters Society has been intimately involved with mule deer management recommendations many of which are in conflict with the need to control chronic wasting disease sweeping across the province. By the way, chronic wasting disease was bequeathed to us by the actions of Alberta agriculture and private interests in an ill-fated attempt at economic diversification. Elk ranching and the importa importation of infected animals into the province started a tsunami of fatal infections of chronic wasting disease in wild ungulates, especially mule deer, that now has spread nearly across the province. I, I could mention wild boars, another goofy enterprise that has now blown up with escaped boars interbreeding with domestic pigs and creating a scourge that is very difficult to control. They're now on the edges of the city limits of Edmonton. This whole scenario reminds me of the old Abbott and Costello skit. Who's on first? <laughs> who actually manages fish and wildlife? Who is who? One thing is clear, some of the remains of the old fish and wildlife division are expected to clean up the messes created by the wildly improbable entrepreneurial schemes of other departments and lobbyists. This has been in spite of the original recommendations from provincial wildlife biologists not to proceed with these schemes. Now, imagine you are in a department, let's call it Mum's Kitchen. It's a tight-knit operation that runs like a well-oiled machine, canola oil. 
<laughs> then someone who probably knows nothing about Mum's Kitchen wants a reorganization. So Knut, who knows everything about <laughs> potatoes, gets bundled off to the trucking department. Leona, a wizard at outreach, advertising, and staff relations, gets packed off to a department called Notions, Potions, and Lotions. <laughs> Klaus, who understands the science of food, its safety and procurement, finds himself in another department called Earth, Air, Wind, Fire, and Other Chaos. <laughs> Under new management, with differing departmental objectives, they can't interact with one another as they once did. The department of Mum's Kitchen is, is reduced to a skeleton and can't perform its original functions. It's hard to imagine, it's hard to imagine any successful business that would operate on such an uncoordinated and non-integrated approach. Like a successful business, the delivery of government programs in the public interest need to function in an integrated way under the umbrella of one department administration with a similar purpose and a similar direction. For Fish and Wildlife to be managed well, there needs to be an adequate, timely inventory of populations, an assessment of what the allocation should be to hunting and fishing interests, ways to monitor population responses to that harvest, <coughs> robust habitat protection, policy development to ensure biodiversity is always part of government agendas, responses to the legal and moral requirements for species at risk with necessary recovery actions, provision of rec additional recreational angling opportunities through fish hatchery operations, a level of enforcement to ensure rules are followed. And keep in mind, these functions are not divisible. They hinge upon one another and can only work as a unified whole. The core functions of Fish and Wildlife Management, species management, protection and recovery actions are not standalone items. Each of them work as a unified whole to ensure Albertans have access to the resource through allocations for consumption and non-consumptive uses, that we meet our legal obligations for species protection, and that these broad policy objectives are conveyed through a government in terms of advice on land and water use decisions. Allocation, the consumptive utilization of resources, is not a distinct function independent of managing fish and wildlife resources. <coughs> fish and wildlife biologists rarely perform just one function. Within the span of a day to a week, each may be involved in population inventories, analyzing data to determine allocation of sport hunting or fishing opportunity, species at risk assessment, recovery planning or implementation, providing input to development proposals to protect populations and habitat, being part of research teams to answer vexing ecological questions, and developing policy for all aspects of resource management. How to divide up a single biologist into discrete functions under a different department without cloning does, is a question that deserves an answer. How fish and wildlife management and conservation will happen in such a fractured way between four departments, all with differing mandates, priorities, and directions, is a question unanswered. It may be the question was never thought of at all. The real risk is that our fish and wildlife populations will slip through bureaucratic cracks, the, the intents for conservation will be weakened, and red tape will increase with interdepartmental conflicts over mandates, budgets, and staff levels. So lastly, why is this happening? 
uh, beware, this is where I get into my rant. <laughs> so, so be warned. It's a real comfort to me to know how many amateur experts there are in the field of fish and wildlife biology and ecology. Some include politicians and even departmental ministers in charge of fish and wildlife management. By dint of just random observation and common sense, they overlook, ignore, or dismiss the academic training, expertise, and decades of experience of biologists to suggest alternate answers to managing fish and wildlife populations. More remarkably, they have done this without the use of aerial surveys, electrofishing, standardized survey protocols, habitat evaluations, water quality sampling, radio coloring and tracking, DNA analysis, modeling, statistical analysis, and all the other tools of science. One would suppose we could dispense with all this expensive, time-consuming training biologists go through, including all of the systematic sampling methods. What we really need to do is to put fish and wildlife management in the hands of those that really know best. The ones who survey constituent opi constituents' opinions in coffee shops, watch wildlife from their off-highway vehicles, or hunt and fish. Really, that has more weight than all of this silly science and those ivory tower biologists. Like selling provincial parks, throwing the eastern slopes open to coal exploration, failing to exercise regulatory oversight in petroleum development, and expanding off-highway vehicle use, gutting fish and wildlife management is just another example of how out of touch the UCP is with Albertans over the conservation of resources considered as provincial treasures. It speaks to a most extraordinary and dangerous hubris. So circling back to Mark Twain on April Fool's Day, I hope this has helped you see the foolishness of the gutting and dispersal of fish and wildlife management functions and the risk of commercialization of the fish and wildlife resource favoring a few over the objections of the many. Thank you. I told you he was good. <laughs> he is remarkable. Uh, I find it so frustrating when you listen to stories like this. We have the knowledge, but we don't apply it. Uh, frustrating, isn't it? Heck no. <laughs> um, we are now opening up for questions and answers. So anybody who wants to come up and ask the question, please do so. Before that first person comes up, I have the privilege to ask my question of Lorne, uh, which is, Lorne, um, where are you? Um, <laughs> you were a civil servant for many years for Fish and Wildlife, and you must have had joys and difficulties. In one sentence or for each, Tell us what they were, please. <coughs> and please come up and ask questions. I spent 35 years at, in the Fish and Wildlife Division, and I, I learned that my role is to provide advice, because the, the decisions that are made are informed by science. What I found frustrating was that when you provided the science, they didn't like the answers. And so myself and many of my colleagues often found ourselves on the outs because we were not providing the answers that were expected. We were providing the answers we thought they needed to hear. Now, having said that, one of the, I think one of the joys of my career has been working with people on the land. 
farmers, ranchers, and others. And uh, you know, they they didn't embrace me warmly the first tech ten years or so. But but as I gained their confidence, I did realize that this was part of developing a relationship, and that with relationships come trust, both sides. It's a reciprocal arrangement, and once that's achieved. It's amazing how much progress can be made on conservation. Uh, Terry Shellington. Lauren, uh, you've given a marvelous survey of the, uh, of I guess a tale of wreckage. Uh, I'm interested in, in shortlisting some of this. Uh, if there are one or two hot spots uh, within this whole field, one of, the, one of the two things that are particularly urgent. What would you uh, What would you name them as a as a short list of hotspots? I'm I'm not sure this is the answer that you were looking for, Terry. But I think the to me, again, based on what I've just told you, I, I think one of the most important things we can do, hopefully with a regime change. <laughs> is glue things back together again. So we actually have a Fish and Wildlife Division that functions as an integrated, unified whole. And that, that to me, is the most important thing. All, all the other things tend to fall out in terms of lesser priorities to that one. Come on, Sakpa. You're good at questions. <laughs> Leona Jacobs, following on that answer. <clears throat> um, so essentially, the division has been destroyed now, more or less, blown apart. Um, is there an opportunity when it comes back together of making it better than it was? And what is that? Yeah, I think there's hope that you can build if, if not a better organization, at least one that resembles the organization that I was part of for many years, that, that was one of the elites within, the, within the North America. I, I think if there, if there is an area for improvement, it would be the, uh, the, the uh, taking the opportunity for Fish and Wildlife staff, particularly the biological staff, to interact more closely with, I, I, I hate the word clients, but, but people who have an interest in the Fish and Wildlife Resource. Because I, I think that one of the thing that, things that's, that's happened, and you know, this actually started with Ralph Klein when he developed the communications branch, which turned out to be the biggest agency within the Alberta government, was biologists lost the opportunity to talk directly to people. It was always done through a communication handler. And that destroyed a fundamental link between biological staff and the public. I think that's the biggest area of improvement. Oh. <laughs> Hi, Hi, Lauren. I, I, I was not going to miss it today or your articles that are in the paper. My name is Frances Schultz. One of my concerns is what's happening right now in the election. This take back Alberta crap, where do you think they stand on all of these issues? Well, I would say take back the Fish and Wildlife Division. I don't know where it went. <laughs> but somebody should find it and glue it back together again. Hi, I'm Ian Hurdle. I just uh, got a kick out of uh, about the fish and wildlife, but remember, poisson is a French word for April 1st. <laughs> anyway, a lot of this audience lost their family doctors. Uh, how you feel in 1992 when they closed the cod fishery in Newfoundland, 
um, and still hasn't come back, what is it going to take in public recognition to give people this kind of support to go back to a, a functioning wildlife division? Thanks, Ian. But that's, that's why I took the opportunity for the little rant at the end of this presentation. You know, I, I don't mean to hold myself or other biologists up as we have all the answers, but we do have some of the best questions. And if you don't recognize that, if you think you know it all yourself, if you forge ahead based on insufficient or erroneous information, you will have a wreck. And that's what we're enduring right now is a wreck with management of the Fish and Wildlife Division. And, and I don't think it's any different than thinking about health care and not trusting doctors and nurses to provide the sort of input that would make for a better, better medical care system. There is a, uh, there's an arrogance, a hubris that I think pervades at a political level, and I think that that's got us to the point that we're at today. Thank you for a great presentation, Warren. I really appreciate it. My name is Bob Campbell. My question is related, it's kind of twofold. We had the recent, well, several months ago, the oil spill from Esso up in the uh, northern Alberta that resulted in uh, toxins being released into the uh, environment, which has impact on people and, of course, fish and wildlife. And nothing became public about that for over eight months. And that kind of relates to what you said. I'm, you know, wonder which department is talking to what department. Maybe they had a discussion but couldn't figure out who was supposed to go public with that. So I want you to comment on that. And secondly, you kind of alluded to it a little bit, but I'd like you just to address the whole issue of loss of habitat around fish and wildlife in this province. Thanks, Bob. Yeah, I've, I've had some interactions, both as someone asking questions of the Alberta Energy Regulator, and also having the opportunity because of a professional organization that I'm part of, that interacted with the Alberta Energy Regulator. And I've got to tell you, at, at least the people that I've interacted with do, do not hardly talk to one another, let alone to other agencies. And as a consequence, they live in a bubble. And, and that bubble, I, I think, provides predictable results. And, you know, <coughs> The, the Curl Lake spill, uh, the spill into the McLeod River uh, from coal mining operations, which went on for months as well without anybody uh, it, telling anybody downstream that might have been a water drinker, that there was something to con be concerned about, I think is an indicator of where we got to with this disbursement of habitat protection responsibilities to agencies that are more beholden to industry than they are to you and I. In, in terms of habitat losses, these are, these are of concern. This is something I've dealt with most of my career and continue to do so. Um, you know, just as an example, you know, we used to have cutthroat trout, native cutthroat trout that existed in the old Manonbo rivers that went down as far as, old, the old, as Lethbridge and Calgary. And now those populations are down to about 5% of their former levels. And yes, you can blame overfishing on them, but, but the reality is when you take a Google trip over the headwaters of the Old Man River and Bow River, what you'll see is a, a spaghetti of roads and trails and blobs, generally rectangular or square, of logging clear cuts all of which can be implicated in the drastic decline of those populations. I, just as an aside, I had an opportunity to speak at a water conference in Grand Prairie in February, and I flew up there flying over the northern foothills, which extend from south of Rocky Mountain House to north of Grand Prairie. 
Uh, by the way, I flew up on Valentine's Day, and what I saw from the air was anything but love. It was, it was like some mad Etch-a-Sketch artist had gone crazy, creating roads, trails, pipelines, uh, blobs of clear-cut forest to the point where I don't know where a moose would hide in the northern foothills. And it's an example where it, it's like the, uh, the syndrome of broken windows. You know, criminologists say that if a, if a window is broken and if it isn't fixed immediately, other windows will get broken. That's what we've done to our landscapes. It's a, it's a syndrome of landscape broken windows. Chuck a page. Lauren, you painted a disastrous situation. We have an opportunity to do something about that with the elections. But we need to get this problem out in a big way so that everybody understands it. But we may have dropped the ball here. I mean, we obviously have. But are there other jurisdictions in Canada, elsewhere, that have actually got things going in a proper way that we can sort of think, well, yes, we have to solve our problem here, but we can get back on course. Thanks, Trevor. Y yes, I think we can look at other jurisdictions, but we can also look at where we came from and what we had and what we could have again, because the template is still available. It's not too late. Um, that, that, to me, would be the most important thing we could do. And, uh, and yes, I am sorry for painting a grim picture, but I, I know this crowd, and you don't like to sugarcoat things, and I certainly didn't in this case. I, I, often, I often go back to uh, something Mark Twain said. He said, uh, you read a newspaper not to be entertained. I'm sorry, Al, I'm going to invoke you here. <laughs> not to be entertained but to make people mad enough to do something about it. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Lauren. Thank you for coming today. It's very interesting. My name is Violet Meekma, and I must confess, my husband and I ATV in the mountains on the trails. And you did mention ATV trails and the expansion of those. Um, we're members of the Quad Squad. We don't cross any streams. We try to be responsible. And I, so my question is, what concerns do you have with the way ATVing is, is handled right now, and what suggestions would you have to make it a sport that we can still enjoy but are not causing difficulties? Thank you. Uh, good question. And I, I don't want to sound like I'm anti-off-highway vehicle, anti-logging, anti-oil and gas, anti-anything. It's we've reached a point in Alberta where we have either got to or exceeded critical ecological limits. We're past the tipping points. And so, you know, OHV activity as an example, throughout the entire foothills, from Waterton Park to Grand Prairie, our footprint, our linear footprint, that's the amount of roads and trails per kilometer squared exceeds any ecological threshold to keep fish and wildlife on that landscape over the long term. So if we want those activities, if we want OHV activity, if we want logging, if we want oil and gas activity, we have to start respecting those ecological thresholds. We have to reduce the amount of activity and restore a whole bunch of that landscape that's been impacted by it. That's the only way that we're going to have quite literally, our cake and eat it too. Thanks so much, Lauren. Beth Mundell-Atherstone. It seems we've got the whole thing upside down. <clears throat> and I wonder about the question of if we didn't call fish and wildlife and water and land resources, but if we called it something like the National Trust or the essence of our being or 
something else. Maybe we could borrow something from our indigenous people who have a more integrated approach. Then we wouldn't, then that would always be in the forefront rather than resources, which seems to invite us to use and then abuse these aspects. Thank you. Good point, Bev. I think we should call fish and wildlife our family, our cousins, our relations, rather than resources. And that might put a completely different spin on it, as you've suggested, because they are, in a variety of ways, related to us. Maybe not evolutionarily, but they certainly are in terms of what their presence or absence tell us about the health of the landscape that we depend on. Colleen Quintel. Um, I'm from Newfoundland, and in 1992, my cousin stood on the steps of the legislature when they shut down the cod fishery. Today, he gets to fish one day in July, and it's called a family day. <coughs> he can't fish commercially anymore, so I know the impact. My husband and I had the, um, uh, we were lucky to have toured the Canadian Coast Guard that cut the nets for the Spanish fleet when they tried to take our cod. Um, a lot of this was federal. So I guess my question to you is, is there any federal oversight of our fish and wildlife? And if there is, is there anything we can do to um, pressure the Alberta government into stepping up to the plate? Thanks, Colleen. Uh, uh, yes, there is a role for the federal government. Uh, despite the Natural Resources Transfer Act, what they did hold back was responsibility for fish, particularly fish habitat, and they held back responsibilities, or at least they exercised responsibilities for species at risk. And so, yes, there is a tremendous role for the federal government. Of course, we know how popular the federal government is here in Alberta. And, and I suspect that that constrains them from exercising their legislative mandates. But, but they have on occasion, we've seen environmental protection orders for sage grouse. I think we're on the edge of seeing one for caribou. And so, you know, those are ways that the federal government can actually be the adult in the room and, and help us with our responsibilities to manage fish and wildlife resources better than we currently are. But having said that, and, and having dealt with agencies like Department of Fisheries and Oceans for years, and, and this is not a diatribe about the staff, who I have a lot of respect for, but at middle management and at the political levels, how do I put this gracefully? There's a lack of spine to actually use the legislation that they are mandated to do in a place like Alberta. Thanks very much, Lauren. Uh, interesting talk. And uh, my name is Dave Major. W what I have trouble getting my head around is your story, you know, talking about coal mining and, uh, and all this other stuff. And yet, I read the news and it says that the NDP and the UCP are neck and neck. I, I just don't understand why such a large portion of our, uh, our population is so difficult to convince. And I wonder if you have any thoughts on, like, <laughs> are we just, are we just not educating our people properly, or? But thanks for the softball question. <laughs> uh, I join an ever-increasing crowd like you do that asks the same question. I, I don't know what it takes. Um, you know, I've been, I've been working as a biologist now for over 50 years, and I've done an awful lot of public outreach. And what I see is a continual need to do even more. 
um, to help people understand, you know, basic, basic and fundamental biology and ecology, so that they have a, a grasp of what some of the situations are that confronts us with the fish and wildlife resource and our own well-being. So I wish I had an answer. I, I, I really wish I had an answer. Sorry. <laughs> Knut Peterson is my name. Uh, thanks very much, Lauren. My question relates to water more than anything. And on the topic of federal jurisdiction, I think I heard that Saskatchewan and maybe Alberta is going to keep federal inspectors off our land. To so they can't test the water in certain places where it really needs to be tested. Can you uh, comment on that, please? Well, first of all, I would have to say that uh, they don't have a leg to stand on. And second of all, why would you avoid having someone who's willing to test water, something that the most fundamental product that we have for our lives and stand in their way. I mean, what logic is behind that? And so I, I think this is part of this, you know, continual flim flammery that we're seeing that uh, is used to sort of rise the base up and have them uh, think that there's this big federal army that's that's uh, massing on the Alberta Saskatchewan border, maybe the uh, Manitoba Saskatchewan border, that that is going to invade us. You know, the 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 next the next thing I'm sure we're going to hear is that Alberta has to have a militia to keep them out. You know, this is the silliness of of this canute. Thanks, Lauren. Ken Sears. Um, just, this is a, a large question, but it strikes me that in all of this talk about these issues, we talk about the foothills, we talk about the, rock, the, the eastern slope of the Rockies, and I hear nothing really about the entire eastern portion of the province, anything much east of here. What are the issues facing wildlife out there? Palliser Triangle and environs, I guess. would. Yeah, thanks, Ken, and, and thanks for the opportunity to get a plug-in for grasslands, which uh, my wife and I appreciate even as much as the eastern slopes. I, I think that the, uh, the grasslands, the, the dry, arid zone of, of southeastern Alberta, suffers because it's like the boreal forest. It's out of sight and it's out of mind for a lot of people. And yet, the issues that confront both of them are similar, maybe different in functional ways, but similar in real ways. The grasslands, you know, there's the, there's the specter of irrigation expansion and what will happen to native grasslands if, uh, if more water is diverted, more reservoirs are built, and this, uh, this uh, idea that we can continue in, a, uh, in an arid landscape with climate change and declining flows, expand irrigated acreage. And where is that going to happen? And the irrigation districts seem to be quite uh, shy about telling us where that's going to happen. And so I worry that some of it's going to happen on native grassland, which, by the way, is the most threatened landscape in Alberta. I, I think as well, the, the other thing that probably it, it may not register as big as irrigation expansion, but it's the expansion of renewable energy, particularly solar farms. There are plans afoot for solar farms of 5,000, 8,000, 16,000 acres. Now, they won't necessarily go on native grassland, at least public grassland, because the province, at least at this point in time, prohibits that. But that doesn't preclude them from going on to private grasslands, which, which will be a real loss. And I think the issues about, about these solar farms, and by the way, we have to deal with climate change, don't misunderstand me. 
But you start, and, and this information, if you Google uh, the Alberta Utilities Commission and look at the map of current and proposed renewable energy projects in southern Alberta, you will be amazed at the footprint that that will produce to the point where some of my colleagues, still gainfully employed colleagues, are worried that these solar farms may extend to the point where antelope can't migrate north and south anymore. And so these are part of the issues, I think. And, and you know, I don't want to, I don't want to necessarily just criticize those things, but I think it's part of a pattern where we keep wanting more. And we've got a finite landscape, a finite set of resources. And having more means something loses. Something loses. And so if we don't plan well, if we don't understand ecological thresholds, things will get lost. And unfortunately, sometimes you won't even notice until it's gone. And that, I think, is the sad part. If there are no further questions from another question. Leona Jacobs. So it seems to me that we're operating in an era of self-interest. In a big way. <laughs> so how, how can we flip this um, to help those currently in charge and currently responsible to understand the consequences in terms they understand. Because I think too much we get in our heads and we, we, we sort of are so immersed in it we know it, but how do we make it so they understand the consequences to them? Uh, you, you mean the consequences outside of the polling booth? Great. <laughs> <laughs> Say they won. Yeah. Uh, Philosophically, I, I think it's about helping us all understand we are part of the natural community. We are not separate from the natural community. We are integral to the natural community and we depend on the natural community. And the more we draw down the bank account that is the natural community, the more we put ourselves at risk. So it, it starts to, to include things like, and you know, I've been beating the drum for native trout for a long time, and, and using the idea, as I did today, that native trout are indicators. They are our bellwethers. They are our report cards of how well we manage the landscape. And frankly, we're failing. We won't even get a C minus. You know, it's, it's a solid F, a solid F. And so until people start to understand that that's the link that helps us understand the water that sustains us economically and physically, we will not make much for gains. But once we make that, people will understand that that's part of our community and we shouldn't keep screwing it up. Lou just gave me permission to ask the last question. Um, yes, yes, you did. Uh, sure you did. Lorne, your forthcoming book, and this is not a advertising for your book, is called Streams of Consequence, Dispatches from the Conservation World. The first three words are really intriguing. Streams of Consequence. Can you explain, please? <coughs> uh, Close has asked me this question before, and I've failed in my explanation, so that's why he's asking it yet again. <laughs> I, I think that uh, it, it's somewhat of a double entendre. Streams include our running water. Streams also include the things that run through us. And if we don't understand those two things, there will be large consequences, as I explained in the previous answer. And so maybe this is a, a way to help people grasp what their connections are to the natural world, irrespective 
of whether or not you watch birds, hunt fish, you know, watch wildlife documentaries, you are still part of that natural world. And that there are consequences to us not understanding that, reflecting that, and making the adjustments that we need to make to be part of that natural community. What a powerful way to f finish this session. Uh, today was, it wasn't interesting, Paul, uh, alone. It was powerful and um, soul searching. And it applies, it doesn't matter how you vote, it applies to everybody. So, Lorne, thank you so, so much. And I thank the wonderful questions which were asked, typical of Sakpa, shining again. So, thank you for coming out on this wonderful day and sharing the company and this wonderful speaker, lifetime of experience behind them, and we had the joy of feeling it, of feeling it. See you next week. <coughs>